So our final speaker is going to be Leon Botu from Facebook AI Research. Hello, so um, um, I had ambitious plans <laughs> and I'm going to treat it in a simple way. Um, the goal of this presentation was to attract the attention on the conceptual opportunity, which I think uh, is important. And you can ask why machine learning, and the problem is absent a formal specification what makes an image represent a mouse. Either we can formulate heuristic specifications and write a program to target them, that's the classic approach, or we can collect a training set, formulate a statistical proxy problem, use the learning algorithms. And uh, with big data, big compute power, what's happening is that it's harder and harder to write a heuristic specification that holds. It's easier and easier to train a big learning system, but there is a big caveat. And the caveat is that the statistical problem is only a proxy. Here is an example. That was a couple of years ago, uh, action detection in images. I'm focusing on the action recognizing a phone call. You have an image, a bounding box with a person inside. The task is to say whether the person is giving a phone call. We got state of the art with the CNN, that was sort of nice. And Maxim came to me and said, you know, it doesn't work. Because when I put my bounding box on the phone where there is nobody, it says giving a phone call. As soon as there is a person and a phone in proximity, it says giving a phone call. This is statistically correct. If you take images on the web and there is a person near a phone, it's most likely giving a phone call. But that's missing the point. So it turns out that in the early ages, while well, we were carefully curating our data sets, if the thing wasn't doing what we wanted, we would change the data set, do everything right. And that led to actual deployments of things that actually worked. But now the data set's too big, we cannot curate them. And control training set distribution, data collection biases, confounding variables, everything. Machine learning algorithms recklessly take advantage of spurious correlations. We see that again and again and again. So that means that we cannot trust too much the data distribution. So what do we do with statistical machine learning then? So a big part of this talk was to show that um, there is a lot of structure in that uh, gap. <laughs> but the important part is that this structure is very related to causation. And if you think about causation, it's also studying how interventions or how selection biases or how confounding factors in the data collection change the distribution. So instead of dealing with one distribution, you have to deal with a collection of distributions which are close and are related by potential interventions. And causation is not just what you hear in statistics where you have interventions and there is a well-established theory. There is about 2,000 years of work on causation. And in particular, I like five viewpoints. So the first one is manipulative causation. Causation that describes the outcome of interventions. It's the testable one, randomized experiments. It's the one that discussed in Pearl and Rubin with different vocabulary, but about the same thing. The second one is causal invariance, and you see that in, in Woodward, for instance. And the idea is that when you intervene on a system, it's very physical. What you need to do is collect the properties that are, you can assume are going to be conserved, find what's changed by your intervention, and try to solve to make a prediction. The third one is reasoning, because it turns out that causation has a dual property. It's both experimental, because you can do uh, randomized experiments. It's also a reasoning tool. So an example is sometimes you reason with things that are not possible. Somebody spoke about superposition, like take a linear filter in a circuit. Uh, we know that the impulse response says everything. But if you were to send an impulse response in a linear filter, you would just burn it. This is not a possible experiment. There is a beautiful theory of dispositional causation, which the idea is the object of powers. When you see an electrical switch, it has the power of being manipulated by you, also has the power to command a lamp. And when you see a lamp, it has the power to be connected by a switch. That means that when you see a new switch in the pure form of reinforcement learning, you cannot know what it does until you try. But when you see a new switch in a room and you see a lamp, you pretty much know what it does. So there is a structure there that's very powerful. And the last one is the one I'm going to go to, which is causal intuition. Uh, back. So here is a scatter plot of two real variables, x and y. The correlation is positive. It's easy to check. But if you increase x, it's clear that y is going to go down. 
So in this graph, you see two things. The first one, you see that correlation is not causation, because if you increase x, y is going to go down despite the fact that correlation is positive. And the second thing you see is that, but there are hints of that. You see two big clusters, and that's a small two-dimensional example. And the claim here is that when you go to high dimension, you have in the tails of the distribution in place where you don't look, not the first moments, but far away in the corner, in the shocks, plenty of hints that tell you where causation could be. They're just hints. Not look, he's not sure. You know, the button in that room, the, the switch in that, in that room could, could command a, a, a fan, not the light, but still. And uh, causal intuition plays a particular role in science. In the scientific method, first of all, the scientific method is a good learning of a learning process. It's a good model of a learning process. Model in the sense of uh, uh, modeling the, the classical scientific sense. And it's a model that we know because it's been discussed. And inside, the hypothesis generation precedes empirical validation. There's a lot that we said about empirical validation, it has to be falsifiable and everything. But the hypothesis generation is something important because it's often the difference between a good scientist and a bad scientist. And if you look at this graph on the left, that's the hersprung russell diagram, well, you see a big structure in there. And people decided that it's very likely that stars come in two categories with different processes. It took 100 years to understand why. And the, the guy on the right has an apple falling. You might know who, it, who this is. And finally, uh, this is a reflection on Rodney Brooks' last uh, comment. Are we smart enough? And that's my last slide. So the scientific method is a good model of the learning process. But at the same time, the scientific method is also our best hope for AI. So this talk presents, or intended to present, a few directions for generating hypotheses on how to generate intelligent causal hypotheses from observations. It's self-referential. And that's the problem of are we smart enough? Can we fit in our head our enough principle to understand how our head works? And self-referential theories have been developed in foundational mathematics. That was not an easy feat. I don't know if you heard about the forcing method and these kind of things. That was that's very tricky. But it's not impossible. The, the kind of abstraction we're using have these infinite properties that we can, uh, it's not infinite, it's something else, okay. But it's possible to reason about oneself precisely by using a model in the right place. But th that's very tricky. And uh, somehow, I wouldn't be surprised that at some point we'd have to deal with that. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leon. We have probably two minutes. If there's a question in the audience, this would be, uh, we still can have that answered. So how do your uh, five uh, hints about causality relate to counterfactuals? I'm surprised you didn't mention counterfactuals. Can, can you repeat? I'm sorry. So, so can you bring back your slide with the five points of view on causality? Uh, can I go? Uh. So how do uh, counterfactuals play into this? Um, the manipulative is counterfactual. But they all have, uh, have some counterfactual aspect. Counterfactual appears also in the reasoning, because it's one of the levels of reasoning. It's the, the domain of thought experiments. And it appears in the invariance, because uh, you want to find properties that are conserved, and therefore they're going to be conserved in the counterfactual worlds as well. The problem is that I, I'm giving this answer, but I realize that the answer might make sense to you, but it's... <laughs> I could have said that. Um, it's not algorithms. I think uh, right now with the manipulative causation, there are plenty of things going on. The causal invariance, we're working on it. And uh, I think it's, it's possible to make a very nice statement. And uh, uh, um, it's current work. <laughs> the affordance is, is uh, implicit in some of the works in deep reinforcement learning, in fact. And the intuition, uh, I think we have some work that shows that it exists, meaning that the, the, the data 
that we get even in image databases contain a lot of causal signals. Uh, it's a complicated experiment. Uh, my intention was really to present leads, that understanding causation in all its subtle aspects is something that can, helps us, that can help us clarify what's between the task we want to solve or the, the, the concepts we want to deal with and the statistical proxy we define. And in particular, in modern data set, we cannot trust the distribution. It's going to be corrupted by plenty of uh, spurious correlation, and we have to understand how to get rid of that, or how to do things that avoid the spurious correlation and go to the core. That can, can be done by rebalancing in many, uh, so for instance, you all know the word to vec experiment where you have, uh, you, you find algebraic correlations in the embeddings that you compute on words. In the corner of the paper, uh, Tomasz says, uh, well, you know, I had to discard all the words that appeared more than 1,000 times in the data set. So basically, he's, he's putting a lot of stress on the tails, removing the head. If you don't do that, it doesn't work as well, and by a good margin. So for another example is that, uh, um, still about language, is that what's the value of language for us? To repeat the sentence that have been said or say new sentences. And it's, I, think, I don't think it's possible to understand the structure of language if we don't understand also that it's designed to allow us to say new things. Now, okay, there is no way I can, uh, I can answer this <laughs> in, the, in, in random order, <laughs> sorry. Obviously, there was much more material here that we ought to have been able to go over, but at least it shows that we had plenty to think about, and we hopefully will think about it in the days and weeks to come. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I've really learned a great deal from this, and I hope you have too.